Very well, uh, Jacob. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation, and it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, great uh, series you're having. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me to talk about this particular work because it was like done during COVID time, uh, and so there wasn't much conferences, and it was hard to present that stuff. So uh, it's already a couple of years old, um, and it was work done with Thibaut Tamaro and Christian Maas. Okay. So this picture gives us uh, uh, shows the evolution of the universe. Okay. So the universe started uh, with a big bang, something like that, and there went a very uh, short uh, uh, period of exponential expansion driven uh, by the infoton cube. Okay, so that only lasted a fraction of a second. Then the infoton field decays into ordinary matter, and then you have a, an area here of radiation domination. The universe keeps expanding, but it's also slowing down. Okay. And after a while, uh, matter takes over uh, as a driving force of the expansion uh, instead of the radiation. So this is about uh, 5,000 uh, after 50,000 years. Okay, Matter takes over uh, to drive the expansion. And then uh, after 10 billion years, uh something else takes over okay it was just matter driving continuing to drive the expansion the universe the expansion of the universe would be uh slowing down okay it would still grow but it would be uh at a slower and slower rate okay? but this is not what seems to be happening okay so there's an accelerated expansion and the usual explanation for that is well there must be something like a cosmological constant. Okay. Because if you look at the ordinary uh, matter distribution, uh, and we also take into account dark matter, this would be insufficient to uh, drive that expansion. So there must be also something, a dark energy, uh, which would make up uh, about 75% of the total, total available energy. Okay. And that would be driving the expansion of the universe. So in, classically, you can account for that dark energy. So that could be a cosmological constant, or that would be some unknown source of energy, some unknown uh, source of matter. Okay, But it would be most easily accounted for classically by just a cosmological constant. Okay, So that means in the classical Einstein field equations, you add here a term which depends on lambda, the, the cosmological constant. Um, of course, we know this equation can't hold. Okay, So we know the right-hand side here is described by a classical matter distribution. We know at the end of the day, quant uh, matter must be described quantum mechanically. Okay. One way to take that into account would be to look at a semi-classical theory for gravity. Okay. Of course, there might be a quantum theory for gravity, but we don't know what that is. Okay. So a step in between would be just to consider gravity still classical, okay. but matter quantum mechanical. So that means this energy momentum tensor here on the right hand side becomes an operator. And one way of doing a semi classical uh, analysis is by taking the classical Einstein field equations and taking the expectation value of the energy momentum tensor operator for the matter distribution, okay? So the matter source is here, the total expected energy momentum tensor. And once you look at that equation, well, a natural uh, possibility that comes to mind as a candidate for uh, dark energy, so basically for that cosmological constant, would be the vacuum energy, okay? So there's a vacuum energy for the fields. Well, that's gonna be our constant, okay? This is gonna be of this form. So there's gonna be a constant times uh, the metric. So maybe this has the right value to be uh, the cosmological constant. Okay. So maybe this is what we uh, observe to, 
to uh, source the expansion of the universe, okay, after 10 billion years. But the thing is, if you do the calculation, so and this has been done very carefully, and Jérôme Martin has written a review paper on that, which is uh, very recommendable. And then you find that uh, this can't be the right answer, okay? So the, this vacuum contribution is way too big uh, to uh, account for the uh, observed uh, cosmological constant, okay? So it's just 10 to the about 50 orders of magnitude up. Of course, when I can always add a constant here again, okay? And one can subtract uh, this uh, vacuum contribution, okay? But then there's uh, this worry here because uh, you're subtracting a really large number to get then exactly that observed uh, cosmological constant, okay? So that smells like a bit of fine tuning. So cosmologists are not really happy about it. So what I want to uh, consider in this talk is well, what happens if you look at full quantum gravity, okay? Might, uh, in, if you consider full quantum gravity, might this cosmological constant come out, like be emergent as some kind of quantum effect? Okay. And the quantum gravity we are going to consider, so the candidate for quantum gravity we are going to consider is this wheeler witt theory. So let me start first with explaining about a bit about this theory. So this theory arises if you take like the most uh, conservative approach to our quantization. Okay. So if you take a classical theory, you can always turn it into a quantum theory okay, by, uh, by the usual methods of canonical quantization. And these were really successful, say in the standard model uh, to quantize the young Mills fields and to get the interactions for strong and weak interaction. Why not apply that to classical general relativity? And maybe this is a way to get a, a quantum theory graph. Okay. Um, so what you need to do that is you have to start from a Hamiltonian formulation. So these usual quantum quantization techniques, you start from a um, Hamiltonian formulation, and then you promote some canonical variables to operators. And uh, that's how the story begins. So this Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, well, general relativity is about uh, a space-time metric, okay? So that's a dynamical variable. And in the Hamiltonian formulation of that, you're gonna split this uh, space-time metric. So you're gonna have a, a splitting first of space-time, so into a foliation. So, and here you see the leaves of the foliation at different times, T1, T2, T3, and, and so on. And on that leaf, on each leaf, you have a, a three metric. So you have a, a geometry on that leaf. And this four dimensional space time metric, you can see as an evolution of this three metric. So this three metric will change along the leaves of the foliation. And so in that way, it will determine a four dimensional space time metric. Okay. So this is also called geometrodynamics. Okay, so it's a dynamics of this stream metric. So if you take ordinary general relativity, you re can recast it in this Hamiltonian formulation and you get an evolution of this uh, three metric. So now you can see, if you apply the usual quantization procedure, well, this metric, you're gonna promote it to an operator and states, these will be functions of that metric, okay? So to each possible uh, three-dimensional spatial metric, you associate a complex number. Okay. So and if you then turn the, the handle of uh, uh, canonical quantization, you get certain equations for uh, that wave function. Okay. And these equations, well, I'm giving them here explicitly. Don't worry too much about the details. We won't need that further on, but this is kind of what it looks like. Okay. Uh, looks a bit messy. So there's a, a part for the metric and there's also a part here uh, for a scalar field phi. Okay. So in the equations that come up from this uh, canonical quantization procedure, they are of this form. Okay. 
So at each point and uh, at each point x, at each uh, spatial coordinate, you have a certain operator acting on psi, and that should give you zero. So this is called actually the Wheeler David equation. And then you have further equations uh, like that. Okay. So you might wonder now, uh, uh, I don't see a Schrodinger equation here. Where is that? Well, there's a Schrodinger equation as well. So, so the standard recipe gives you this. So time derivative of the wave function gives you uh, this total Hamiltonian acting on psi. Okay. But here you see, well, this H and this HI, this was just these uh, operators. Okay. And you see here, these acting on psi should give you zero. So what this Schrodinger equation tells you is, well, the time derivative of psi has to be zero. Okay. So if you just apply the usual quantization techniques, what you find is the wave function doesn't evolve in time. Okay. And so here you get an immediate problem. Okay. So the universe seems to be evolving. Okay. I just told you about the expansion of the universe. If this wave function is static, how, how can we account for that expansion of the universe? Okay. So this is a, a really troubling thing, okay? And so many different proposals have been uh, suggested to deal with this problem. And but there's difficulties with many, many of these proposals. So Kukash back in the day has written nice reviews on, on these proposals. So um, what I will do is, well, tackle or, or approach this wheeler bit quantization from the Bohmian point of view, okay? In the Bohmian uh, formulation of the wheeler bit theory, this problem will disappear, okay? So what is this Bohmian mechanics? Well, um, very shortly, well, this is an alternative to quantum mechanics, which solves the measurement problem of quantum mechanics, okay? And what it describes is actual point particles. So according to Bohmian mechanics, so the world is made out of point particles, tables, chairs, everything is point particles. But the way they move is not by classical mechanics. It's determined by some uh, uh, new dynamics okay, where the velocity of each particle is given by the gradient of this function s. And this s is just the phase of the usual wave function. So the, the wave function is still there. It satisfies, say, in this case, the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. And what this wave function does, it, it determines the velocities of these particles. Okay. And so here you see an illustration of just a double slit experiment. So particles uh, come out of the slits. Okay. And so each particle, we can send in each particle uh, one at a time, and each one will follow a certain trajectory. And you can see that they tend to bunch up where there's interference peaks and they avoid regions where there's uh, destructive interference. Um, so it's a non-classical dynamic. So, and you can actually see that by taking the time derivative of that equation. So this is the basic equation. It tells you that the velocity is given by this gradient of the phase. If you take another time derivative of that, you get this Newtonian uh, type equation. And here you see uh, the usual potential and some additional potential, which depends on uh, the wave function. So you can discuss and, 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 and work out deviations uh, from uh, classical mechanics. Okay. And these, this quantum potential is usually going to be relevant if you look at microscopic trajectories. So here in the double slit experiment, you see here, uh, this quantum potential really plays uh, an important role. Okay. These are non-classical trajectories. Um, so what's more so, uh, also very briefly, so there's some notion of equilibrium in this theory, okay? Because this did, Dynamics is completely deterministic. Okay, you have to say something about probabilities. So, how do probabilities come out? Well, uh, the initial position uh, is unknown, 
and it has a certain uh, distribution. Okay. And there's a special distribution called the quantum equilibrium distribution. And this quantum equilibrium distribution is just usual psi squared distribution. And in quantum equilibrium, you just get the usual quantum results. Okay. So you need to do some work to see that, but you can show uh, that uh, this theory, so Bowie mechanics gives you the usual quantum predictions, at least insofar that these usual quantum predictions are unambiguous. Okay? Because of the measurement problem, there's ambiguities in certain cases, what exactly does quantum mechanics predict? If these can be set aside, why? Bowie mechanics just gives you the same predictions. Nevertheless, it gives you like different types of uh, tools and approximations you can do. Okay? And so uh, cosmology will, will be just one example. Um, so this was the, so this was the dynamics in non altruistic uh, uh, Bohmian mechanics, so just uh, velocity equation and then the usual Schrödinger equation. So there's never collapse of the wave function. Wave function always evolves according to Schrödinger's equation, and the wave function determines the velocities of these particles. So you can do the similar. You can play the similar game for uh, this really the width theory. Okay. So you have these constraints on psi, so h and hi acting on psi should give you zero, fine. And now psi itself, again, determines the velocity, okay? So here, I've denoted now this uh, three-dimensional spatial metric by h. So the time derivative of h is given basically by, again, a derivative of the phase. And similarly for the scalar field, if you have a scalar field, say, it's some derivative of, of phi. So this Bohmian uh, quantum mechanics, it's again a geometric dynamics. It tells you how the evolution of a three-dimensional uh, metric or a three-dimensional uh, geometry evolves uh, in time. Okay, And this is the evolution equation. And you can also see it doesn't matter that psi is static. Okay, So even though psi doesn't evolve in time, this is going to be a non-trivial equation, at least most of the time. So this is going to be a non-trivial equation, and you're going to have a non-trivial dynamics for the stream metric. Okay. So here you can ex start exploring, okay, uh, what happens to the universe uh, given a certain wave function. Uh, do you have uh, uh, accelerated expansion or not? Uh, do you run into singularities or not? So and let me just go a little bit uh, more in detail about how that works. Like, for example, from that equation, so from this dynamics, you can also uh, um, derive a, a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. OK? Suppose you want to derive something like a non-altruistic equation here, uh, which is explicitly time-dependent. How can you do that? OK? So and. Um, the nice tool we use for that is, well, it's something called like the conditional wave function. And that's a notion of a wave function for a subsystem. So suppose I have a wave function having like here n plus m, describing n plus m particles. So I'm working non relativistically here. Suppose I have this wave function describing n plus m particles. What can I do? Well, I can define this wave function of the system by evaluating that wave function for the uh, m positions. So the y, the y's here are the actual uh, positions of the particles, so the, the Bohmian positions. So by evaluating this total wave function, so this could be the wave function of the universe, say, by evaluating that at the actual positions for these m particles y, I get a, a wave function for my uh, x particles, OK? Of course, you can always play that mathematical trick, but what does it give you? Well, the interesting thing is that, well, if you were to calculate for these x particles the velocity, you could either use this uh, subsystem wave function, psi s, or you could reuse the wave function psi. Okay, So you just get the same expression. So, so it's easy to work out. Okay, So this is an easy exercise. So, but this is the value of well, so this is why it's interesting to consider this 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 particular definition of a wave function of a subsystem. Okay, 
you get the same velocity if you were to calculate it using psi s or psi. And now you can see that how, how you, for example, could apply that to uh, cosmology. Okay, suppose now I have my wave function of the universe here. So my wave function of the universe depends on this tree metric, depends on the scalar field. And now suppose it's approximately of this form. Okay. And suppose I can, so, and suppose my equation for my three metrics, so my bone in the equation for my three metric, the dominant contribution comes from uh, psi zero. Okay. Um, what can I do? Well, I can look at this conditional wave function for the scalar field. Okay. If I do that, so I take my uh, total wave function, if I evaluate that for this uh, actual metric, so I get a wave function for my scalar field. And so I can look at also at the time derivative of the scalar field, uh, of this wave function. So if I go back here, like my wave function of the subsystem, well, you see where does the time dependence come from? Well, on the one hand, the wave function of the universe was time dependent. So there's this T here, but also these positions here are time dependent. So there, there's an extra complication here. And this, this thing here, this conditional wave function might or might not, not satisfy some nice equation. Okay, so if you take the time derivative, it might satisfy some effective Schrodinger equation, or it might not. Okay, depends on the situation. Okay, so if you do that here, and under certain circumstances, under certain uh, conditions, you can approximate this by by some uh, effective time dependent Schrodinger equation for just a matter of you. Okay, so you can see that from the static wave function and using this. Uh, this booming ingredient that you have an actual metric evolving according to some dynamics, there's a certain recipe to find the time uh, dependent uh, Schrodinger equation, say for the matter field in this case. So what I've described here, I'm, I motivated it from the booming point of view, but this is actually, what I've described just here is exactly the WKB approach to the problem of time, okay? And this is, for example, described in, in Kiefer's book on quantum gravity. Um, but of course, if you just come from standard quantum mechanics and, and, and all you have is actually the wave function, this is actually kind of badly motivated, okay? So where does this metric come, come from, okay? If all there is is your wave function, so you don't have this Bohmian ingredient, you can write this down, but what is, does it conceptually mean? Okay, so you don't have an actual metric, you just have the wave function. And why would you plug in this, this quantity here you find by integrating this equation? Why would you plug it in in the, the universal wave function? Okay, so this is kind of ill motivated. Okay, so people like Kiefer and well, the people before him say, well, time is emergent from this wave function. But to me, it seems like uh, there are some rather ad hoc steps taken uh, in getting this emergent time. But you see, from the Bohm point of view, this is really well motivated. Okay, so and you just you don't you don't only get this usual WKP approach to the problem of time. You can see there's many other things you can do. Okay, so you can, for example, consider higher order corrections to this WKP approach, or you can look at back reactions from uh, matter onto uh, gravity and so on. So there's a whole approximation scheme you can do using these Bohmian ingredients. Okay. And actually just as an interesting fact, so the first people to propose uh, Bohmian quantum gravity weren't actually, were, were not actually people working on Bohmian mechanics, okay? Those were people working on this WKB approach. And in this, double, in this WKB approach, you assume that this psi zero is a classical state, okay? In the sense that these integral curves here give you a classical dynamics, okay? But some people realize, why do we actually need this classicality condition? Why don't we just 
always just assume these equations. So we can always do that without, even without the classicality condition. Okay. So basically, they said, well, let's ignore this classicality condition and just always assume this. So basically, they assumed this boom in dynamics. Okay. And this was done like two papers, one by Padmanabam, so the astrophysicist, and, and another green side. Okay. So about the same time. It was only shortly after that, like uh, people working on Boeing mechanics, like uh, picked up on that and like uh, saw uh, that uh, doing just this is just playing the Boeing game. Uh. Okay, so uh, this is this is another direct digression a bit. So, but I think it's an interesting one. So, uh, so one thing is. Uh, you can get to a whole lot of uh, approximation schemes to get effective e equations of motion, okay? And so people have studied that to quite some extent. So we have a review paper on that. So where people like Pintoneto and others have applied these approximation schemes to get uh, equations that are applicable to cosmology, okay? So another thing you can do is, well, look at space-time singularities, okay? so. For example, this is really the bit equation, but uh, it is one way of doing uh, quantum gravity. There's another uh, way of doing quantum gravity and that's called loop quantum gravity. Okay. But this is a, a, a still a, a, a way of, well, this is still a theory that emer uh, arises from using the usual uh, quantization recipe to classical GR but using a different set of uh, canonical variables, okay? So in uh, loop quantum gravity, the claim is made well that loop quantum gravity could solve uh, the singularity problem, while uh, uh, the really bit theory can't, okay? So classically, this is a result of the Penrose and Hawking theorems, a singularity like Big Bang, well, this is basically unavoidable, okay? And now in quantum gravity, well, there's not only the this problem of the, uh, there's not only this problem of time, this problem of how to get time evolution from a static wave function. There's also another problem, right? So what actually do you mean by a space-time singularity? Okay. If, if all there is is the, the wave function, what does it mean to have a, a space-time singularity? Okay. So and like people have proposed different uh, definitions. For example, you have a singularity if the wave function has support on singular matrix, or when uh, the wave function is peaked uh, around singular matrix, or when an expectation value is singular. Okay, but, but none of these really make much sense, right? So, for example, the first one, psi has support on singular matrix, but these singular metrics, they have, they have with any reasonable choice of measure, they have measure zero, right? So why should one worry about what happens in support of the wave function on sets with measure zero? Okay. Or if you take an average, so on average you don't, in, you're singular, but what does it mean for our universe? Okay, maybe our universe is non-singular. Okay. But you see. In the Bowman case, well, you have an actual metric, okay? And your notion of singularity is just the classical notion of singularity, okay? So, uh, and this has then to do with geodesic completeness, okay? And so you can investigate in the Bowman case, well, do you actually have singularities for this actual metric or, or not, um, okay? And the upshot is, well, in the real width quantization, yeah, it's possible that you have singularities, but you can also have situations where you don't have singularities, okay? So uh, singularities can be avoided, okay? And it all depends on, first of all, the wave function and then the initial configuration. So the initial three metric and scalar fields. Yeah. And if you look at loop quant quantum gravity, okay? So which is very close actually to the ability of theory, okay? You can actually also look at a Bohmian formulation of that. And there you find, well, then you can show that well, there's actually never singularities for any wave function. 
Okay. Which is kind of interesting because that's actually stronger than what the loop quantum gravity people usually derive. Okay. So they look at a, a certain class of wave functions usually. Okay. So you, they can't usually derive it for any wave function. Okay. And I should also stress while well, these results are only for mini superspace. Okay. And I'll be coming to that in a second. So these are simplified models of quantum gravity. Okay. For full quantum gravity, nothing is known. Okay, so now back, back to the main topic of, of this talk. Well, so if I start from this Bohmian quantum gravity, okay, so I have a, this particular evolution equation for my three metric, this quantum geometric dynamics, if you wish. If you take another time derivative, you get the Einstein field equations back. Okay. But just as like what I showed you classically with this Newtonian equation with the extra quantum potential, here too you get a correction to the classical Einstein uh, field equations. Okay, so here you have a T mu nu, which is given by the usual matter content. But here you get an extra T mu nu, which depends on the wave function really. So uh, this is really of quantum origin. Okay. What I want to explore in this talk now is that uh, could this account uh, for the accelerated expansion? Okay, for for example, in a special case, maybe for certain wave functions, this is just like a cosmological constant times uh, the metric. Okay, and there have already been some results. Well. Uh, which indicate, well, th this might not be so far-fetched, okay? So this might be interesting to explore. And so one thing is the following. Well, remember, if we did the semi-classical gravity, there was always this vacuum contribution. So in the semi-classical theory, we took the expectation value of the quantum operator for the energy momentum tensor. And there was always the vacuum contribution uh, to the energy density. Which was 10 to the 50, uh, uh, which was 50 orders too big. Okay. Um, and you would think, okay, this will always be uh, some constant you, you have to sub subtract even in quantum gravity. But the thing is actually, no. Uh, why not? Well, there are special wave functions. Okay. So if you take a real wave function, so let me go back a bit. So if you take psi real, you can always have solutions like that, but that means the phase is zero. When the phase is zero, basically the metric uh, is static. So it doesn't change in time. Okay. So if everything is static for a real uh, wave function, that means that there can't be this uh, vacuum contribution here in the energy momentum tensor. Because if there's a vacuum contribution in energy momentum tensor, it will always drive expansion. OK, so you will have always expansion. But here, so there's, so there's particular solutions which are real and for which you don't have the expansion. OK? And that would be, for example, for the hartle hawken wave function. So this is a particular uh, proposal uh, for a solution for the really the equation, and that's a real uh, wave function. Okay. So, um, so for these real wave functions, of course, there's no vacuum contribution, but there's all, it's also everything is static. And of course, we see evolution of the universe. Okay, so this such a wave function can't be described our actual universe. Okay, but you can imagine small deviations from some, such real wave functions where you have evolution and maybe a cosmological constant just the way you want. Okay. Maybe also a remark, so from the Bohm point of view, this Hawking wave function is no good because everything is static. Okay, so that, that that's in contradiction to experience. Okay, the universe evolves. So from the Bohmian point of view, this wave function is out of the window. Okay, so that would be empirically inadequate. But note here that people doing standard quantum gravity uh, have investigated this wave function very much. Okay, This just means that what I said before, that the Bohmian theory gives you the same predictions as usual quantum mechanics. You can't make this case here anymore. Okay, 
So this would be a counterexample. So this hartle halkin wave function, people make all kind of predictions up, uh, from it. But from a Boolean point of view, th this wave function is no good. And it was an all, uh, another previous result was that, well, that explored uh, these modifications for stiff matter. It means, stiff matter means that uh, um, uh, the density equals uh, the pressure. So the pressure is equal to the density. So that's this is a particular kind of form of matter. And of course, that's not really suitable to describe our universe. Okay. So what we did is like look at a simplified model of quantum gravity and consider the situation of dust. So matter dominated uh, universe. Uh, so dust where pressure is zero. So there's just uh, energy density. If you consider quantum gravity for that, can we get something like the accelerator expansion? So in here, uh, these are the classical Friedman equations, okay? And these are the classical Friedman equations under the assumption that uh, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So this is our simplifying assumption. Instead of uh, uh, considering the theory in all generality, we consider uh, the universe uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic. Okay, and if you look at large scales, well, it, it is approximately uniform and isotropic. So in classically, that's a good approximation to make. And if you do that, well, the dynamical uh, variable here in the metric is the scale factor. So the scale factor A basically tells you the size of the universe. So if A is growing, that means the universe is expanding. So this is the spatial line element. This is the omega. You can consider further different curvature of this of the spatial surfaces. Okay, but here throughout the talk, I will assume that the curvature, that spatial curvature, is always there. So we basically just have the scale factor uh, telling you how the universe expands or maybe contracts. And that expansion or these dynamics of the scale factor is determined by what actually is the matter content of the universe. Okay. The matter in the simplified scenario can be well, it's usually described by a perfect fluid. So a perfect fluid where the pressure is just proportional. So the pressure P is proportional to uh, the energy density rho. And the proportionality constant uh, is denoted by omega. So in a special case of a, a dust universe, so ordinary non relativistic matter, this omega is zero. So there's no pressure. There's just a density. Uh, if you had radiation, then there would be non-zero pressure. Or if you have an actual cosmological constant, then P equals minus rho. So with the, the Friedman equation, so the, the, the equation describing the evolution of the scale factor, these are of this form. Okay. Uh, and here, lambda is added. So lambda, that's the cosmological constant now. Okay. And that makes all the difference in a row. Okay. If that is added or not. Um, so if there's no cosmological constant added, then uh, A, the scale factor would grow like a T to the power two thirds. Okay. The universe would grow, but it would be slower and slower. Okay. And here is a figure of that. So if we just had no cosmological constant and just with this dust content for the matter, the universe would grow, keep growing. So this curve too would keep growing, but at a slower and slower rate. So here, curve one, that would be in a closed universe where you have non-zero curvature. So curvature is one. So you would start with a big bang here, go to a maximal expansion and then contract again and to, to a big crunch. But if you have curvature of zero and add a cosmological constant, you have this curve three. Okay, so you have first expansion, then it slows down. Okay, so first it's the dust driving the expansion, and then the dust is completely diluted, so the density of the dust is zero. And then what takes over is this cosmological constant. So 
And here it is expansion. Here is driven really by the cosmological constant. And that keeps going forever. Okay. So now let's do a quantum version of this uh, Freeman uh, uh, theory. Okay. So, so what we do is uh, we just look at this theory, this classical theory here, and we just quantize that. Okay. So in our toy model for quantum gravity, we don't start from full quantum gravity and derive somehow effective equations. No, no. It's more much more simplified uh, way. It's called mini superspace uh, quantum cosmology. And what you do is you just quantize this uh, uh, symmetry reduced uh, theory. Okay? You just apply the usual quantization techniques to this uh, classical symmetry reduced and third. Okay. And if you want to model dust, well, you can uh, you can first uh, um, introduce some tricks to, uh, to, to find the Lagrangian formulation. Okay. So, so you want to have rho as a dynamical variable, but the way to do that really is to introduce another like potential field T, okay? So this is still on the classical level. So to have a Lagrangian for your Friedman equations, you introduce this potential field T, and T is just a function of time. So because of homogeneity and isotropy, it can only depend on time. And its dynamics is really trivial. It just tells you that the time derivative is plus or minus one, okay? But if you introduce this capital T, you can write down a Lagrangian, and you can apply the usual quantization techniques. Okay, so if you do that, you get a wave equation like this. Okay, so one curiosity is that this roof drops out of the equations. Okay, so you're just left with a wave equation for A and T, and it's written very suggestively, right? So this looks almost like Schrodinger equation. Okay. But actually, you shouldn't make this hasty conclusion to say, ah, this capital T, this must be time. No, no, it was this extra variable you've introduced to be able to write down a Lagrangian formulation in the first place. OK, so why take T as a uh, time variable? Or you could have equally well chosen A. Might have been more complicated, but there's no particular reason why you uh, should prefer one over the other, OK, or, or if the matter contribution was more complicated. Why would you choose one matter degree of freedom over another to, to play the role as a time variable? Okay. And also, the, so there's no cosmological constant here. And, and this is the wave equation we will work with. Okay. And what one usually would do in this case is, well, look at, again, at, at an expectation value. Okay. But it's not so satisfactory. Okay. So here again, we use this Boolean formulation where you have an actual uh, variable A, an actual scale factor, and an actual variable T, and a certain quantum dynamics for them. Okay, so the wave function determines a certain velocity field for the scale factor and for this capital T. And here you can see that well, capital T basically acts as a good clock variable. Okay. Time derivative of capital T is just minus one. So we can actually eliminate T here and write everything in, in terms of uh, T. And this little t is actually cosmic proper time. So we assume here this form of the metric again. Okay, so T here is cosmic proper time. So time for an observer going along with the expansion of the universe. Okay. So um, if, you, if you massage that a bit, we can write it in this form, OK? So time, and now here, I use this uh, time derivative now. Time derivative of psi equals uh, that operator acting on psi. And my Bohmian scale factor satisfies that equation. You can rewrite this in the form of Friedman equations, OK? With this extra contribution again. So just as I showed you before, 
the Boolean dynamics entails uh, uh, a modification of the class lines of the field equation dependent on the wave function. Here, too, you see uh, there's a contribution coming from the wave function. Okay. So you see this uh, acceleration equation. There's this extra uh, term here. Okay. And let me go back here to the classical equation so you can see. So for dust, p equals 0 here. And you just get this term with rho and the cosmological constant term. So now compare that to what we derived here in the quantum case. You see the classical form, and there's an extra contribution. And maybe for a certain amount of time, this could act as a cosmological constant. So all that remains is to find solutions and see what happens. Okay. Uh, one further modification. So I can still massage, the, massage this uh, equation in an even more familiar form. Okay. If I do this change of variables, x, I introduce x, which is proportional to a to this power, I get this equation. Okay. And I hope. This is familiar to everybody. So this is not the normal domestic Schrodinger equation. Okay. There's a certain parameter n here. Okay. And this contains a whole lot of parameters, gravitational constant, speed of light, but also the volume of, of the universe. Okay. Uh, and so this is a, a parameter which is very large. Um, and so this is a normal domestic, normal domestic Schrodinger equation. But since the scale factor is always positive, this means that well, you only have to consider x positive. So this is always the Schrodinger equation on the half line. Okay, and now you can fill in uh, wave functions. Okay, and if you take say a plane wave as a solution, well, what we find is well, this the actual scale factor. So this Boolean scale factor, it behaves purely classical. Okay, so it's always going. Uh, like t over two thirds. So even in the quantum case, you can get this classical motion. Up. If you take a Gaussian wave function, you will have the classical motion for late times, okay? But for small, well, for, for times near zero, uh, you won't have this classical motion. Actually, what will happen is you will have a bounce. So this universe, well, if you have, for a Gaussian wave function, the universe will start very big will contract to a minimal scale factor and then expand again. So this is called a, a bounce or a big bounce. So here in this case, you, you wouldn't have a singularity then. So A always stays positive. There's just a minimal scale factor with a bounce, but then it expands. So this is basically the simplest wave functions you can consider. So the next simple thing is, well, consider a superposition of two Gaussians. So if we consider a superposition of two Gaussians, well, here we're in, in business, okay? And here we can actually already fit like the evolution of the universe up until, so from the beginning of the universe until the present day, okay? So what's shown here in this plot is, well, uh, this green curve is the evolution of the universe if there was no cosmological constant. So you take... Uh, um, the ordinary matter content of the universe, so including dark matter, so that would be cold dark matter, more precisely. So, but if there's no cosmological constant, you see the universe must have st started uh, much later, okay, to get to the present uh, uh, scale factor today. So, yeah, so time goes from zero to one, and zero is that's near the Big Bang, and one is. Uh, present day. And of course, we, we didn't take into account the early stage of radiation-dominated evolution. So this is always dust evolution, so just as an approximation. And this is, this is valid for most of the history of the universe. Okay? So this is two Gaussians. So and more detail, it's like two Gaussians which cross each other. Okay? So for two Gaussians that cross each other, there's a large range of initial um, uh, uh, scale factors A for which you get like a really good fit to the actual evolution of the universe. So 
the orange curve is the uh, quantum evolution, so using this Boolean dynamics, okay? And the blue curve is what you would get if you had an actual cosmological dance. Okay. So you get, get a really good fit and well, playing with the parameters, you could even fit it way better, okay? So this was even a, a crude fit, okay? But you see, for the purpose of the hand, this is already uh, excellent. There's gonna be a difference uh, compared to uh, the lambda CDM model. So compared to the case where you have a cosmological constant, because if you have a cosmological constant, you would have expansion forever. Whereas for this superposition of two Gaussians, it it wouldn't this expansion wouldn't stay forever, but it would uh, decay again, and you would have classical uh, evolving universe at late times. Okay. And so this was another uh, possible solution. So this is uh, a solution to the Schrodinger equation that uh, that Michael Berry uh, came up with. So this is an airy packet. It's a non-normalizable packet. So it, so it's it's usually not used, but here uh, we can play around with that. And this is a non-spreading packet. Okay, and also for that packet and with suitable initial conditions. You can get really good fits. So uh, the blue curve is the classical cosmological model with the cosmological constant, and this orange and green curve. These are just uh, uh, fits with our Bohmian quantum graph. Okay. Again, if you would wait longer, you, these curves would diverge. Okay. Uh, for example, here the pressure would be minus rho over two at late times. Okay, so with, here I can conclude. So, like in this, it is a simplified model, of course, right? This mini superspace, uh, and you just apply the usual quantization techniques to the symmetry reduced uh, classical theory. Uh, this might not be any good, but this is just a proof of principle. But at least in this case, you don't need to introduce cosmological constant. Okay, and you get to get can get the accelerated expansion as a quantum effect. Um, the question is, of course, well, what's going to happen in full quantum gravity? Okay, I can't answer that question, right? So this would really require further analysis. Like here, okay? So you should keep in mind, we have a lot of degrees of freedom to play with, okay? So because we could have, but we have a lot of freedom uh, in choosing the wave function, okay? So we could have probably fitted a lot of different data. Okay? You should remember here a von Neumann's quote, that well, uh, if you give me four parameters, I can, um, I can fit an elephant. And if you give me a fifth, I can even make it strunk, wiggle. Uh, so this is also applies here, right? So we have a lot of degrees of freedom to play with. There's the wave function. There's also the initial, uh, value of the scalar factor we can play with. So we could have fitted a lot. Okay. But nevertheless, so there, there is a possibility here, okay? So which is worthy of further investigation. So if you take full quantum gravity, we've seen if you have a real wave function, uh, the universe is static. What if what happens if you consider slight deviations from a uh, real wave function? Can you maybe get small cosmological constants? Uh, I don't know, okay. Um, maybe one further interesting thing is, well, there's also this Hubble tension, which is considered like a, an interesting uh, problem for cosmology. And that means that, well, if, so there's different ways of measuring the Hubble uh, constant, so, or the Hubble rate, which gives you the rate of expansion of the universe. And one way is to look at galaxies now and see uh, how fast they move apart from each other. This is a late time measurement, but you can also determine the Hubble rate from um, the microwave background. Okay. Uh, and if you do, so, and that means that you're really measuring the Hubble rate uh, in the early universe. Okay. Or the evolution of the universe till now. And you see there's a huge discrepancy uh, between them. Okay. And so 
it's unknown where this, this cup of syrup exactly comes from. Okay. And maybe one thing is that well, this cosmological constant is might not be constant at all. Okay. And if this cosmological constant is really a dynamical effect coming from uh, quantum gravity, well, this could maybe account for that. Okay. So there's no need for this uh, uh, effective cosmological constant as was displayed here by this Bohmian dynamics that is that is always constant. Okay. So here, this acceleration uh, um, disappears again in, in these examples we considered here. Okay. So there's something here worthy uh, of exp uh, exploration. Okay. So this is just uh, scratching the surface with this uh, simplified toy model. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll end here. Great. So do we have any questions? All right. Well, I have a question. Uh, Perhaps, um, Ward, would you be kind enough to unshare your screen? Sure. Great. Okay. So I have a whole bunch of questions. Um, one is about, uh, so you showed this plot, and I've asked you to unshare your screen. <laughs> but you showed this plot where, where you showed, uh, um, you know, our, our you know, observational data on the expansion of the universe. Uh, and then, uh, you know, fits to this from the Lambda CDM model and then fits to this using various choices of wave function, mm -hmm. uh, of universal wave function. Um, you mentioned that with two superposed Gaussians, you were able to get pretty close uh, to to the, uh, the, the empirical observations and to the Lambda CDM model. Um, how finely tuned are the Gaussians in that example? Um... So maybe if you want, I can explain a bit more, right? Why where this acceleration is coming from? Uh, right. So, so it, it was like one-dimensional Schrodinger equation where you have an actual it's like an actual particle being driven by this uh, one-dimensional wave function. Yeah. Okay. So you have this. If if I would just had a Gaussian, okay, if it was spreading a bit, my particle would be somewhere within the Gaussian and maybe it spreads a bit, but it follows the motion of the Gaussian and it spreads a bit. Okay. That's that, that what would happen if it just had one Gaussian. Right. But now I have these two Gaussians. Yeah. And one is overtaking the other. And what happens is first my particle is in the first packet. It's guided by this packet, follows the motion of this packet. But then once this second packet hits, it gets swept up by the second packet and then is further stuck in the second packet because of the deals of the dynamics. Uh, okay. So first it's guided by this first packet and then the second packet is taken over it. And so, because this has a bigger velocity, it gets picked up by the second packet. So whenever you have, whenever you have that, such a dynamics crossing, you always get a period of accelerated expansion. For the rest, it's yeah. just by uh, getting the parameters right that they put the data. But in particular, uh, small modifications to the um, mm -hmm. properties that characterize the two Gaussians, that doesn't lead to large changes in the shape of that curve. Not really, not really. OK, no, good. No. That's very interesting to note. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and you have to take a certain range of initial positions as well. But for quite generic set of initial conditions, you get this type of evolution that's typical for a period right. of accelerated expansion. Right. So it's and fairly natural, times yeah. diverges. Right. Great. Thank you. Uh, our first hand is from Andrea. Andrea, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Sweet. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess um, I had a couple questions, but I'll try to pick the one that matters more uh, well we should have time for your other questions okay so to just yeah we'll have time for all of them um okay so you just ward you just talked about how the two gaussians would be different by virtue of like some propagation speed for mm -hmm. the center of the wave packet mm -hmm. okay so but are they are they real gaussians though 
uh, are they complex? These, these are just ordinary Gaussian solutions to the normal domestic Schrodinger equation. Okay, so um, I'm just trying to understand why the dynamics. So they're not trivial. real. So th there's, they're not real. Oh, like I'm, a free particle Gaussian. Yeah, yeah, they're just okay. ordinary spreading the spreading Gaussian. Got it. Okay, because I was okay. wondering why the dynamics is non-trivial at all. If, if... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. get a complex solution. Right? It's a normal domestic Schrodinger equation, right? So. Okay. Complex solutions. Um. Okay. And do you do you have any sense for how such a a superposition of such wave functions would arise? Oh, no, 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 not at all. So this is just my. Well, just taking the simplest solution to this uh, really ready equation, so, which happens to take the form of the normal Schrodinger equation in this case, just some solution and see what you can do with it. Okay. Because uh, in full quantum gravity, things are going to be, might be very different, right? So there's going to be coupling. So you can consider these. Uh, 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 homogeneous degrees of freedom, and then the perturbations uh, from homogeneity. homogeneity. Okay. okay. So that would be uh, the next level, okay? But then these perturbations will be coupled to these homogeneous degrees of freedom, might cause decoherence. So a uh, superposition so like that, which I just described, one, one Gaussian crossing the other, that might already be destroyed by decoherence effects. Hmm. So I have no idea, right? Because I didn't look at the details of okay. complicated dynamics. Uh, so this is really just a proof of principle. So these wave functions I've just shown, you shouldn't take them too seriously. Okay. It's on the level of what's called mini superspace. And that's mainly where calculations are done. For example, also like this question that I mentioned earlier, um, do you solve the singularity problem in quantum gravity, yes or not? Uh, people have only looked at mini superspace models, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and this might suggest, might be suggestive of something that also holds in the, in the, okay. in the deeper, more complete theory, but there, there's no, yeah, you would have to do extra work to show that. Got it. Okay. Also, uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wait to ask my other questions so we can get a few other people in. Thanks, Andrea. It's good to see you. Guido, you you're next. Thank you. Um, Bart, I, I was uh, intrigued by your last, uh, last, uh, last remark, uh, you know, what, what would be the effects of, of decoherence? And uh, um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm just wondering what, uh, what you are thinking, um, because, well, A, Looking at mini superspace, maybe you know far too simplified uh, in order to mm -hmm. in order to get an intuition there. You know, but uh, uh, yeah, quite generically, you know, we think of decoherence as uh, you know a convenient way of getting classical solutions out. But mm -hmm. you don't want the classical solutions. Uh, you know, this is a, a quantum effect uh, that uh, that you want to that you want to keep. Um, uh, I mean. Could it be that because you know we are looking at cosmology, uh, you know, you know, there might be the hope that we can keep this quantum effect because there isn't any relevant environment? Uh, or yeah, what uh, what are your thoughts about that? Um, so, so indeed, there's a question, right? So, I'm looking for a quantum effect, a large scale quantum effect. Usually, we think uh, those are microscopic. Uh, so, I'm, I'm not sure myself either, right? Uh, it's just that this really the equation seems to allow for like uh, very non-classical solutions in the sense that these static solutions, okay, uh, these are simple to obtain but very non-classical, okay. And so so why not? Um, okay, that, that's the the most I can say. Uh, mm -hmm. For it, it just requires further analysis, okay. And I don't know how easy that would be to do. Uh, I just haven't looked at it. And for example, one step would be just to look at, and there's models for that, right? But it gets complicated. If you have a background and fluctuations joined together, 
what exactly can you expect to see there? And indeed, that's why I mentioned it in the last slide, the coherence uh, can make all the difference in the world. So. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Squido. Um, so I see Andrea's hand again, but we have a, a, a person who hasn't yet asked a question. Stephen, um, do you want to go go ahead? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so thanks for the talk. I enjoyed it. Um, I think my, my question is uh, maybe along the same lines as what Jacob was asking, um, which so you, you started out by talking about the fine tuning problem in cosmology of the, um, you know, observed rate of expansion, uh, cosmological constant being being much, much mm -hmm. you know, many orders of magnitude smaller than what we get from the vacuum energy. Um, <clears throat> I guess my concern is whether we're just replacing one fine tuning problem with another one by in, it seems like you'd have a similar requirement here to pick precisely the right initial wave function to produce that. So I guess, I mean, you said that um, the uh, results are not very sensitive to the initial condition of the wave function in terms of reproducing the acceleration. But are, is is there a sensitivity to the initial condition of the wave function in terms of getting the acceleration, you know, close to what uh, the, the value that we observe? Yeah, so, so you're absolutely right, right? So you're also, there's some sense of fine tuning, okay? When I said to uh, Jacob's first question, so uh, how much sensitivity is there to uh, the initial data? I was even considering just a class of solutions where you have these crossing Gaussians. And for that class of solutions, you get generic uh, period of expansion. But like for other wave functions, why you can make up all kinds of solutions to the Schrodinger equation, it will give you all kinds of different solutions. So yeah, yeah. Okay. This fine tuning problem, <clears throat> Okay, yeah. so this this is it, not meant it to looks like more solve the, like in, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. And so really so for for me this is just a proof of principle there might be something here that that's worth exploring uh, like uh, what you find from semi classical gravity is that uh, there is always this vacuum contribution okay here in the quantum gravity it, it doesn't need to be there there are solutions where there is no vacuum contribution so this gives you some hope of well maybe if you do more detailed analysis. You find reasonable wave functions for which hmm. does the does the scale of the because you know in semi classical quantum gravity the, the the scale of the um of the vacuum uh, energy is just you know so many orders of magnitude higher than what we observe mm -hmm. does that scale have some physical meaning in this for, I mean is is like if you if you had some you know distribution of random initial wave functions, would that energy scale be meaningful in terms of like the the expectation value of the, you know? Oh, I, I, don't, know. I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not an expert on these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, interesting, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a quick question before uh, Andrea, I'll, I'll call on you next. Um, so the freedom to pick the universal wave function and the fact that different choices of universal wave function can give in principle very different behaviors for the cosmic expansion, um, uh, I guess raises the question about predictivity. Um, in a sense, we have the empirical data that we know, you know, from observations, what the curve roughly looks like, and we can certainly pick uh, universal wave functions that will closely approximate, that will give us a good approximation to that uh, cosmological evolution. Um, but because we have this freedom to pick the universal wave function, and it seems like a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. um, can we use this approach to make genuine, unique predictions? Well, here it would be difficult, right? Yeah. Like, and I, I think that's just an artifact, really, again, of the mini superspace model. Because what I mentioned, like these crossing Gaussians, right? So that makes a difference that you get this uh, period of acceleration. So suppose there's further Gaussians coming coming down. So right, right. Be, so you can in the future, a lot of various things can happen. Uh, you can have classical evolution of the universe, or there might be again periods of accelerated expansion. I can always find wave functions with, which gives me either of those. Uh, 
Because yeah. It, there's way too much freedom there. In the, uh, right, right. I mean, so one way that I, I sometimes like to think about Bomi mechanics is, mm -hmm. well, you know, the approach that Shelley has, has, mm -hmm. uh, has, has um, argued very eloquently for that, um, yeah, one way to think about, about Bohmian Bohmian mechanics, in particular the Bohmian wave function, is that it's kind of a law of physics. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some ways, this is very, um, very natural from an historical point of view, mm -hmm. right? Because you know the way Schrödinger found the Schrödinger equation was was looking at the Hamilton-Jacobi theory and you know and and making all these analogies to wave optics and eventually arriving at the Schrödinger equation with the Hamilton's principal function um, ending up as the phase of the wave function. Um, so, you know, there's a sense in which it, it's quite natural to think of the wave function as being like a kind of counterpart to the Hamilton's principal function, which is itself, you know, built out of the action functional, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you change the action functional of your theory, you're changing the Hamilton's principal function. And that, you know, naturally corresponds to changing the, the pilot wave. So there's a sense in which this sort of nomological view of the pilot wave is actually very natural. Mm -hmm. um, but what it also means, of course, is that when you change the pilot wave, you're changing the laws of physics. Um, and, you know, one of the ways that, that we often think about, uh, you know, quantum field theory these days, this sort of effective field theory paradigm is you, you write down uh, an action, you know, a, a integral of, of a Lagrangian of local terms, and you sort of write down all the terms that are compatible with the symmetries that you think hold. Uh, and then you have to make some argument that only finitely many of those terms will ultimately have empirical significance at some experimental scale, and the rest are sort of negligible. And if it's possible to generate non-trivial predictions using only finitely many parameters, those parameters, of course, you have to take them either from experiment or from some of the theory, but with a finite number of parameters, you can make arbitrarily many predictions. We say that we have a useful effective field theory, um, in this approach, it kind of seems, I mean, the worry I think is that because you can change the wave function in all these different ways, it's like it's like having an action functional with infinitely many terms and all the terms have potential empirical significance. It's not immediately clear how to identify some finite subcollection of terms, the rest of which can be ignored as an approximation and then, and then to use empirical data to fix a finite number of parameters and then make non-trivial predictions. It kind of seems like the whole wave function is an infinite number of variables. Mm -hmm. um, this is why it, there's a little bit of a concern here about predictivity. Does this make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. Th that makes perfect yeah. sense, right? And what yeah. you described as effective filter, exactly something like that should be done like in this really with theory then right. to, to make actual predictions. So yeah, yeah. See if you're for natural wave functions, you get exactly uh, this kind of behavior or not. Uh, it seems like a very natural target for work would be to, you know, find some way to express the universal wave function in some parametric way with some set of parameters, and then to formulate something like an effective field theory argument where you argue that only some of the parameters are going to produce meaningful observable effects at some scale. We can then take those parameters from experiment and then make predictions. Um, that seems like a meaningful target for, for further work. Yeah. Yeah, and there's going to be extra constraints coming in, right? Because now I just had an equation for the scale factor. Like the right. funny thing was, like the even the, the mass density disappeared from the equations right. by just the condensation recipe. So you, you can imagine if you look at a full theory and do that, that, it's not going to disappear. Theory. You're going to have additional co co constraints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's going to be the actual matter distribution of the universe, right, which has to fit what, what we see and what we think the evolution of the universe roughly was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but there's going to be all kinds of constraints like that. Great. All right, this is very clarifying. Thank yeah. you. And yeah, like, yeah, if you see the wave function as a law, well, in the old days, people thought, okay, maybe the wheeler the equation gives you a new, unique solution, which would really fit this picture. That would be great, but it, it doesn't yeah, do that. But it doesn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, yeah. I have I have lots more questions, but I want to get to Andrea again. Andrea? Yeah. Um... This might be kind of a follow-up to your previous question. Um, so if you consider like a slightly less simplified case where the you don't just get this like free particle Schrodinger equation, um, if it's a slightly non-trivial Schrodinger equation, then it'll have some particular ground state, presumably. Um, and 
I would imagine that in most situations it would be like a real valued ground state. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm, I'm worried that like you might lose some of the interesting dynamics in a slightly less trivial case. Yeah, so, uh, so it might be tricky here, right? So because you talk about ground states, if you look at the real of theory, they all basically have energy zero. Okay, so <laughs> if if you think about the Hamiltonian of the universe and look for the ground state there, but they're all ground state, they all have energy zero. Okay. Uh, okay. So, There's no, then in what sense can you distinguish different states uh, for a given Hamiltonian? What? Um, well, they're going to have different evolutions, right? So, like different solutions to that constraint, which all have energy zero, total mm -hmm. energy zero, total Hamiltonian zero. They, they give completely. They might give completely different evolutions for the actual scale factor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, one type of solution you have just static. Your your metric just stays static. Okay, but for others, you will have an expanding universe. Okay, and you can find simple solutions to that. And like in a functional Schrodinger picture, you can find simple enough solutions to that. Hmm. So, um, okay. Approximate solutions. Um, so, okay. Uh, could I ask a slightly different question? Yeah, before you do that, let me just say, so one way to get some intuition about this is um, if you take a classical system described in a Lagrangian formulation, um, uh, you can always introduce a reparameterization invariance. You can take your time parameter and replace it with uh, some smooth monotonic function of time and treat that as your time parameter. And when you do this, your original time parameter becomes like your other degrees of freedom functions of this new parameter. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then your theory has this reparameterization invariance. It's a form of gauge invariance in which further changes to this new parameter you've introduced don't have any physical consequence. Uh, and this gives a, a kind of covariant looking representation of Lagrangian formulation, in which time looks a lot like one of the other degrees of freedom. Instead of the other degrees of freedom being functions of time, the degrees of freedom and time are all functions of this new parameter. And shifting this parameter doesn't have any physical significance. And if you just naively write down the Hamiltonian now, treating time like one of your degrees of freedom and treating this new parameter like, quote unquote, like your time, what you'll find is that the effect of Hamiltonian you get identically vanishes. Yeah. Uh, but, it, it, but, but of course, there's the solutions to this theory contain all the old solutions. It's just that according to this newly defined Hamiltonian, they all, quote unquote, have zero energy. There's a, a sense in which when you have a reparameterization invariant theory like GR, that that they have zero energy in that sense. Yeah. And the Wheeler DeWitt equation is closely related. It's like a quantum mechanical version of that classical story. So in the quantum case, are there no other operators that would let you, you know, distinguish states in a uh, reasonable way? Like maybe not the Hamiltonian, maybe there's some other kind of physical operator that would be important to study the eigenstates of. Yeah, if you've got different wave functions, then they'll be eigenstates of various operators. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and also if you do like this WKB approximation, right? If your background can like be solved independently, you get like this emergent time dependent Schrodinger equation. And of course, you can analyze those effective Hamiltonians. Uh, in mm -hmm. that case, uh, okay, yeah. but there's no need that that would be then a ground state or I, I don't know. Yeah, there's just like in the classical case, because all of your old solutions are there, the old Hamiltonian is implicitly hidden inside. Mm -hmm. It actually turns out to be like minus the canonical momentum conjugate to your time, treating your time as if it's like a degree of freedom. Yeah. So just in in a, in an analogous kind of way, there are effective Hamiltonians that will emerge in in the quantum case. Okay. Great. Um, 
So I thought we had a hand to Travis. Did you have your hand raised? Oh, Travis isn't here. Ah, okay, Travis left. Andre, did you have a follow-up question? You said you had another question. Yeah, I did have another question. Um, but th this goes back to the, uh, like one of your first slides and you talked about how one way to treat matter semi-classically is with uh, T mu nu being replaced by the expectation value of T mu nu with respect to a vacuum state. Um, I was wondering why why one has to choose the the vacuum state there. You know, presumably there's a lot of particles flying around, and so the relevant state would be some complicated n n particle state um, of the standard model. And wouldn't we care more about some quantity derived from that state. Yeah, you're absolutely right, right? So, but you would have like extra energy contributions from these particles, okay? So there would be a minimal contribution coming from the vacuum state. So all the excitations would just give you added energy. So it was just to show that, well, that there must be minimal, this vacuum energy yeah. contribution. And then of but course- it, yeah. yeah. I wonder though, like if you're considering now an n particle state in mm -hmm. the standard model, mm -hmm. is it safer to subtract away the vacuum contribution uh, oh, okay. in any sense? Well, so you, you have to be careful what you subtract. Uh, I, I don't know the details, right? But like I know uh, this uh, Jean Martin did a really excellent job. So, uh, because there's all kinds of things you have to think in account, all the different matter fields in the universe. Uh, some have positive contributions, some have negative contribution to the vacuum energy. Right. Yeah, the uh -huh. vacuum will give you a negative energy con contribution. Also, that uh, curved space, uh, some uh, minimization. So um, they did a very careful job, like just using standard field theory. That's what they got for. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll take a look at that paper. Yeah. You'll understand that better than I do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andre. I have a couple more questions. So, um, you know, in, in this approach, we're simplifying the story a lot. We're working, you know, with a very significantly reduced set of degrees of freedom. We're not working with like local field degrees of freedom. Um, so, you know, in this approach, there's no reason to, uh, you know, to, to think about, um, you know, contributions to the vacuum energy from, you know, all the local field degrees of freedom in the standard model, let's say. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, I guess a general question I have about Bohme mechanics, Bohme field theory in particular in, you know, presumably it has some relevance to this, is how are we to understand what happens to those uh, vacuum contributions? Yes, it's true that if the universal wave function is real, then it's static, and then sort of by fiat, they all have to cancel, the universe is going to end up being mm -hmm. static. Um, but I guess I'm, what I'm, I'm having some difficulty understanding is like, so what's happening on the ground? What, what's happening to all those contributions um, we can certainly impose that the universal wave function is real from the, the point of view of starting from standard traditional quantum mechanics mm -hmm. and quantum field theory. Uh, you know, you, you have to add up all the contributions of all these fields and then find out what happens. Mm -hmm. it, it, are we just to understand that somehow there's, you know, these, these, these local fields are making these contributions and there's like, a quantum potential that is exactly canceling them? Is this how to think about what's going on? I think that's exactly right. But you just said that's exactly right. Yeah. So I guess this is where I'm, I'm, it, that just, I mean, on the one hand, that seems miraculous in a good way. Like, wow, without mm -hmm. really much work with a pretty simple choice of universal wave mm -hmm. function, a pretty natural choice, take it to be real or take it to be approximately real with a, with a you know, not super finely tuned, but small phase factor. And somehow all these cancellations just happen. Mm -hmm. um, is it really? Is that really what's going on? It, it seems a little magical that you know that you have a ten to the depending on you know whether you have 
Naively, it's like 10 to the 120 contribution with supersymmetry, it's 10 to this, you know, but you have many, many orders of magnitude contribution bigger than the observed vacuum energy. How can it be? Maybe it is, but I, I just like a better intuitive understanding. How could it be that, that a relatively insensitively defined universal wave function can cancel so many orders of magnitude so close to zero? What am I missing here? And also without doing any work, right? You can right. Actually, if you have a complex solution, uh, that means you have two real solutions. And for all these real solutions, you have this feature. Yeah, I was just thinking, so I was thinking maybe making the analogy with the... Um... Uh, you... Travis, I just saw you rejoin the meeting and I know you had your hand raised and I want to just let you know that you're in the queue if, if you still want to ask a question. Great. All right, go on. I'm so sorry, Ward, please keep going. No, no, so I, I don't know if there's an analogy here, but if you have a ground state of say like a particle in a box or if you have a harmonic potential, the particle will be standing still. So it would be wrong to think it's fluctuating around, but that is causing the vacuum energy. Okay, so right. here too, like the kinetic energy will be zero. I'm not sure again what the happens. Uh, Right, yeah, only mechanics, sure. the particle is really at rest when it's in the ground. And, and the quantum potential will cancel the, the, the... I see, so from this point of view, what's going on is that is mm -hmm. that by default, all the fields near their ground states really have no kinetic energy. The cancellation yeah, is yeah. happening at the level of each individual field degree of freedom, yeah. sort of automatically, because that's how Bowman mechanics works. Yeah, so, so I should check carefully right what i'm saying but at least the kinetic energy is zero and maybe the total energy is well at least it's a constant maybe it's but you can see like you have different features um, in the Bohmian dynamics uh, and the quantum potential can cancel out like the ordinary potential yeah. even though there's an ordinary potential the quantum potential cancels out the fact that that you have a potential there okay so the total potential will be constant i think okay so if you have zero velocity initially. But now I'm I'm slightly confused, and, and this is probably an incredibly mm -hmm. elementary question, but uh, of course the variance of a harmonic oscillator in its ground state is 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 not zero. Exactly. Yeah. Um that's coming from if the particle is just at, at rest, where is the variance exactly. coming from? Well the because you're looking at a a, a distribution. Ah, of course. Of initial positions. Yeah, right, right. So it's coming. Okay, yeah. So it's 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 so essentially it's always the same wave function for an ensemble, but the position yeah, can be yeah, different yeah. each course, time. Right. It's always static. Right. But there's a certain distribution, and that's where you. That's how you calculate the variance. But you see, but here's the question, then, right? If there's a if there's a a, a non-zero variance in the. Uh, no, I guess that, that 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 that's right. Okay, all right. I'll I'll. Let me, let me stand back. So Travis, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the nice talk, Ward. It's uh, good to see you. It's been too long. And sorry that I'm having to pop in and out because it's my office hours and there's like annoying students sometimes, you know, so. Um, so originally I was going to, I think, ask about the sort of fitting an elephant point that then you raised at the end. And then several people are already kind of like pushed on that a little bit. Um, it, I mean, is it fair to say like, yeah, so a Gaussian, I don't know, there's like an initial position for the middle of it and some kind of velocity and maybe like an amplitude and a width or something. And there's two of them. So there's like eight free parameters or maybe seven if there's some like normalization constraint, like sort of that's in the ballpark at least, right? Oh, yeah, it's, and it's an initial wave function, right? So it's basically yeah. an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So yeah, no, I just mean like even like, I'm thinking of this no, case Gaussians, of yeah. the superposition of two Gaussians. There's like yeah, 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 maybe right. seven yeah. free parameters or something yeah, like yeah. that. Um, and so it's from that point of view, not at all shocking that you can kind of fit whatever you want, mm -hmm. as people have uh, I think now pointed out clearly. But so so that point having emerged so clearly, I thought maybe it's worth kind of looking at it from the other point of view, I mean, you know, it's not like you invented these many super space models or something like this is a thing that people play with and it's like some simplified toy model and like, yeah, in the sort of Bohmian versions of these, you can kind of get the, you know, the 
the actual a value to do whatever you want by like picking a, a certain wave function. But, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but presumably like when people are, when sort of non-Bohmian people are playing with the same kind of toy model, something like the same thing is true. Like you can kind of get, you know, whatever they, whatever the stand in for like a is, which presumably is like the expectation value or something that people would use, like you can kind of get that to do whatever you want too. And so like i mean is it true that like yeah this is you can get any behavior you want that. from the bohmian version of this by picking a wave function but that's kind of true in the non-bohmian version mm -hmm. as well right <laughs> yeah here we have an extra degree of freedom that choosing the initial scale factor <laughs> but but no no apart from that yeah, yeah. I, I think I mean super space models are nice okay you can calculate something but they're way to simplify it for sure. And indeed, this is a comment you can always make. Uh, and also, when people do other kinds of or establish all kinds of results, but they're just a mini super space models, you should always be careful. Uh, okay. It hints at the possibility that this is also true for the full theory, but uh, this is really no guarantee. Like, uh, to, to my knowledge, even little has been done to just derive like this mini super space version from the full theory. You, you would think ah, you can start from a full theory and then you do some manipulation, some approximation, and you get to something like the meaning structure. But even that, uh, to my knowledge, right? Little has been done. So all these mini super space results, indeed, you should take with a grain of salt. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, thanks, Travis. I have a question that's a follow up to that question and a follow up to a lot of the questions so far. Um, so, when people study uh, mini super space models, they, they often have principled reasons to consider various choices that they make in studying these models. You mentioned, for example, the Hartle Hawking vacuum state. There are like mm -hmm. principled reasons why someone might mm -hmm. uh, might favor taking that to be the, the vacuum state that they're using. Um, and, you know, from, from, you know the point of view in your your talk there are reasons why that's not the best choice mm -hmm. uh you've presented a couple of choices of universal wave function that give um you know a behavior that looks familiar are there any principled reasons to pick particular choices of wave function or even classes of wave function i mean your choice of gaussians and, and this is related to, to the questions we've had right Gaussians are particularly nice and simple, and we we you know these give nice wave packets. We we use these all the time in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But like, is there a good principled reason to pick them or some other class of wave functions? Not that I don't know. Uh, that, that's the yeah. short answer, right? But you can start to speculate, right? Well, the idea that you would start with something real and then consider small, like you know, uh, yeah, yeah. if it's a phase, that seems like a pretty principled thing to do because you're starting from. Mm -hmm. A static solution and considering small mm -hmm. corrections, but mm -hmm. but even then, like how how do we what class of functions are we using to to parameterize the deviations from the real case? It's mm -hmm. yeah, it'd be nice yeah, to know yeah. if there were some principal reason to pick one class over another. Yeah, so so I don't know, like what you said. Yeah, I haven't looked at that actually, but like you could look at the real solution to that equation here, and that would be just I think superpositions of. Uh, plane waves, so plane wave coming in like this and plane wave coming like So I, I don't know, but like, I, I see little, uh, have little, little inspiration to like select a, a nice class of functions. So, but maybe one, one thing is like, but it's pure speculation, right? So suppose you demand that uh, your wave function as such that for whatever initial configuration you have, you never have a big bang signal left. Right. That's gonna give that you would a huge reflection. Okay. Right. Right. I've investigated that also in mini super space models. That get, that gives you only a small class of wave functions. Too. For example, stuff like that, but uh, that has been insufficiently explored. Um, Good. Hmm. Uh, Guido, I, I see your hand. Yeah, <clears throat> just a just a follow up to that. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, in uh, in many standard models of decoherence, uh, you know, Gaussians, uh, you know, are they you know, are 
are the preferred wave functions that pop out. So yeah, there might be some some uh, some, some arguments, but uh, uh, yeah, whether that applies in this case, who knows? Right, right, because you know they're picked up by decoherence. They correspond to coherent states. Uh, they're minimal uncertainty wave packets, right? They have all these sort of right. Um, that certainly makes them makes them uh, special. The question is whether there's a, a principled reason why the universe should be special in that way. Hmm. But decoherence could give. No, I'm, I'm saying. I mean, yeah. yeah. If, if the, the if there actually is a decoherence mechanism out there, you know, then yeah, then we don't need to worry, and that's it. But uh, right. yeah, who knows? Yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Like, yeah, you're right. If you if take into account other degrees of freedom in this decoherence, maybe that singles out Gaussians. That would be a good argument. Um, and, maybe, and maybe, can, maybe I can add something. And here in particular, because it's it's crossing Gaussians, right? Here I would be extra afraid that because of it's it's a macroscopic superposition, really, right? Of the universe doing one thing and the universe doing another thing. That extra that, that the perturbations will cause the coherence here and at least entail just one or the other gauge. But okay, I haven't seen any details, right? But this is something you might worry about yeah, in this particular case. Andrea, I think you wanted to also add something. Um, yeah, I was I was just going to say that, like in in most kinds of bosonic QFTs, like if gravity is anything like that, then the ground state is kind of Gaussian like. Um, maybe if it's an interacting theory, it's dressed up in in some way um but that's a somewhat natural way that gaussians kind of are important in uh bosonic field theories at least mm -hmm. um, and here too in the ground state the boolean configuration would be static right yeah as you know well. <laughs> but yeah for for any like n, n body state the time, you know, the time evolution of it is no longer a trivial Bohmian dynamics. Um, mm -hmm. So if anything like that could happen in the uh, case of gravity, then. Mm -hmm. um, Great. I don't see another hands. Are there any remaining questions? All right, I think we can finish early then. So stay tuned for an announcement uh, for the next speaker in two weeks. Uh, that'll go out to everybody. And I wanna thank Ward again for a wonderful talk and leading an excellent discussion Q&A. Thanks again. And yeah, thank you for uh, the great questions, everybody, for attending this talk. Thanks. And it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, I hope we'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Thanks for spending your time with us and have a wonderful, wonderful couple of weeks. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care.